All right. Um, welcome, everybody, to um, our webinar series on vector symbolic architectures and hyperdimensional computing. So uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the summer session. So it is already a traditional one. So exactly one year ago, we met in this 2D settings, rather 2D settings of Zoom to discuss hyperdimensional uh, uh, issues. Uh, and um, so far we are doing great. So uh, there, were, there have been two seasons of webinars and now uh, we are welcoming the, the third one. So summer in 2021. Uh, so we have a great program uh, for the uh, months to come. And uh, so without any further delay, I want to leave the floor to our first speaker, Gitan. So please. Thank you, Yeni. Um, yeah, so I'm also glad to present on the first day of, or the first uh, session of this summer session of uh, VSA um, webinar. So, um, uh, so uh, first let me introduce myself. I'm Gintan Kamarat. I'm a doctoral student at uh, IBM Research at Zurich. Um, and uh, this work uh, is, uh, is titled Robust High Dimensional Memory Augmented Neural Networks. I hope you can see the slides correctly. Right? So it's all fine, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this was a, a collaborative work between uh, IBM Research uh, Zurich and Kids Zurich. And uh, I would like to now mention the uh, valuable contributions from uh, the other authors, Manuel Schmuck, Manuel Ecalo, Giovanni Cervini, um, Luca Benini, Abu Sebastian, and Abbas Rahimi. Um, Right, so I think for those all of who are, who are today at the, um, in this audience, um, uh, hyperdimensional computing or vector symbolic architectures uh, is, is nothing new, so there's no need to give a, a lengthy introduction. So I will quickly give you um, some of the, the applications uh, that have, um, that have um, um, uh, been successful with the uh, with an, with an HDC classifier. So these include uh, language classification, uh, text classification, uh, biosignal processing, human-centric computing, and emotion recognition, and etc. So in each of these cases, we have a, a, a certain HDC classification framework, which look like this. So we have this HDC space and we uh, feed in the inputs uh, to, a, uh, to this origin space and it's sent to a, a pre-processing step and a transformation step. Uh, after that, they are ready to be uh, admitted to the HD space or the high dimensional space. And there we do some kind of seed generation to exploit some randomness. And these hypervectors are then um, um, subject to some local operators, uh, mutation, multiplication, bundling, uh, addition, etc. And the, the generated encoded hypervectors, we will place them in an, what we call an associative memory during training. Um, and uh, another key feature of HDC is that it allows us to do continuous updates so that we can continually write to the associative memory when we get new classes, etc. And during uh, the time of inference, we can simply use the same floor up to here and then do a comparison or search through the associative memory to find the matching matching candidate class. So this is what we are now sending back as our output to back to the origin space. Um, so um, so so in the previous slide we saw which were some of the application domains where HTC has been successful. But there are even still there are some some application domains where HDC is struggling. For example, take the uh, digit classification and digit and written digit classification application uh, with the MNIST dataset. And in this case, if you use the similar flow um, you know, with the naive HDC mapping, uh, where uh, we are generating an uh, feature vector for high dimension feature vector for each of the 784 pixels. In this case, we achieve just a 75% accuracy. But we can improve this uh, accuracy by uh, applying certain iterative optimizations on, 
uh, and then still we get only a less than 90 percent accuracy compare this with the other standard machine learning models such as okay nearest neighbors and support vector machine in these cases we get uh, an easily uh, more than a 98 percent accuracy so uh, now the, the the difference here is um, mainly due to uh, HTC not being able to uh, is, is, is having um, problems in generating a good encoding. So uh, this is where we want to make an improvement to have a, a better encoding scheme that allows us to um, exploit further with uh, in, in, within the operations that we can perform in the HP space. So. Uh, so for this the solution that we are um, proposing is imagine a deep neural network with an HPC uh, uh, classifier on the back end. So uh, this is our standard HPC framework which we saw earlier, and then we are now proposing uh, some some new uh, uh, approach. So in this case, we are replacing all the pre-processing modules, uh, the seed generation modules. Uh, encoding modules, all of them with a single a deep neural network. And then we are uh, guiding this deep neural network to um, generate the high dimension vector representation, which is similar to what we have gotten uh, from a, a classical HDC framework. So basically, you want to map and uh, make a mapping or a replacement module for these different stages that we have in our classical or traditional HDC. So, so the key idea we can summarize uh, like this. So we have a, a training methodology that will direct uh, representations that are coming from a deep neural network, such that they are uh, they are suitable for manipulations in a high dimensional space. Um, so we are investigating uh, several aspects for this. One is the meta learning. Uh, so that is um, being able to. Uh, have a have a, a system which can learn to learn different representations, and, um, and also we are looking at uh, developing an interface between the, the deep neural network and the, uh, the HDC domain. Um, and then we look at how we can treat the attentions. The attentions are uh, uh, how we compare different vectors in the high dimension space. Um, and we also look at certain loss functions and, and try to derive some loss functions that uh, that allow us an easy integration between a deep neural network and a, a, a backend HDC space. So, uh, so to uh, investigate our idea, we look at a certain type of neural network uh, architecture called memory augmented neural networks. Um, so, uh, as you know, in a, in a standard or a classical neural network, we get certain inputs and we send it to a, a, this neural network and we get a, the output representation. But we have seen uh, this long standing problem in a, in a neural network architectures that is um, this catastroph catastrophic forgetting. So, in order to um, uh, avoid these problems for having a catastrophic forgetting um, what people have suggested is to integrate a certain external memory module which we call the explicit memory so now we are um, providing some mechanism for the neural network to write certain structural representations to this external memory and read back from this structure representing memory uh, which is now sitting external to the neural network um, now if you compare this with our a model that we have proposed for integrating a deep neural network with the HPC uh, backend. Uh, we can now see some analogy here. So this new in this network, uh, now we, we look at it as a controller, which can control this explicit memory, and this controller will be a, a certain deep neural network. And this explicit memory will, will look like this associated memory that we previously introduced, which has this high dimensional representations. So this idea has previously been explored uh, in several notable uh, works. So two of them are from DeepMind. Uh, one is called Neural Turing Machine, and one so another one should be uh, with the demands of the memory of material methods. And there is another work from Facebook, which is also exploring the idea of an augmented memory attached to the neural network. 
and uh, that's a common thing that, that is that is uh, seen in all these different uh, example works is that uh, there is a, a, a slightly there is a, a considerably large uh, memory component or memory module uh, as is shown with these with this, uh, orange colored boxes and and then there is a controller that interacts with this memory module so the question is is a good question that's trying to be answered in each of these work is how we can interact with this memory component to uh, to get the uh, the best results so um, to to answer this question we look at a, a certain type of application that can be solved with memory augmented neural networks and it's, it's called the future learning so future learning uh, i will go to step by step and give you a, a, an idea of how this future learning works um, and and first like i will go through how the training uh, methodology of a future learning uh, um, Future learning program works. So it starts with the first step, which is the loading of key value memory. So any of the future learning problem um, is, is uh, defined by a, a, some number of ways and some number of shots. So this means in this example, we are considering a three way to short problem. This means uh, we have a, a, a set of examples or a place for order for. Um, for some exam, keeping some examples. Uh, in these examples, together they they are called the support. And and when we say it's a three-way two-shot problem, that means we are taking examples from three different classes. And from each class, we take only two examples. So since we are only exposing um, uh, our controller or the neural network to only two shots. So this is why it's called a future learning problem. Um, and, and now, um, uh, yeah, so, so basically this will, this controller will generate a, a, a vector representation. We call it the support vector because it's taking inputs from the support. And this will be now stored in a, a place called key memory. Um, for each of the examples, uh, there will be a place, place order to store the, the, the results in, in what we call a key memory. And there will be a separate place to store the, the labels corresponding to uh, each of the, the support vector. And together, this value memory and the key memory, together, we, we, this is what we previously introduced as the explicit memory. So uh, now let's see that, uh, let's take the example where we are, um, we are exposing our controller or the, the whole flow to a different set of uh, some examples. So we start with a one um, example from a certain uh, alphabet, a character from a certain alphabet, and, and then we will send it through the support, the, the controller and generate the support vector and it is stored it in the the corresponding placeholder in the key memory and the corresponding label is stored on the value memory and we next uh, take the next example from the same class so this will again go through the controller generate a support vector representation this will be stored in the corresponding placeholder in the key memory corresponding label will be stored in the value memory we will continue this operation until we fill the whole key memory and the value memory with the, the corresponding representations that are generated from the controller and the labels corresponding to that. Um, at the end of this, at this end of this uh, stage, we have reached our first step of training a future learning um, uh, training future learning uh, uh, module. So now we go to the next step in the this involves a uh, query evaluation and back propagation. So we have um, uh, filled our key memory and the value memory with the uh, with the necessary uh, representations, and then we will we will get an, an example query which is uh, which belongs to one of these three classes. And this will similar to our previous step. It will also then go through the controller to generate a query vector representation of the same dimension and identity as it was for the support vectors. 
And in this, this stage, we are comparing the query vector with uh, each of the um, key memory vectors. And this will generate uh, a certain similarity score for each comparison. And uh, when we um, line them, line all the similarity, similarity scores together, uh, we call this the attention vector. Um, and we will do a class-wise aggregation of these attentions based on the, the labels that we saw on the value memory. And then this, this, this gives us the, the final uh, result, uh, which is, a, which is a, um, which is representative of uh, we hope it will be representative of the query. Now we also have our ground truth, which is a one hot label vector, uh, which says what is actually where they actually the query belong to. We can back propagate that result with uh, the result that we generated using cross entropy, uh, for example, the cross entropy. Loss and this uh, this loss uh, generates certain error terms and this will be back propagated through the the whole architecture up to the controller and we can use the the error terms that that is generated for the controller to update the controller corresponding to the the query that it was shown and we can repeat this process with other queries in the query set uh, to further update the controller. And, and this, up to this point, we call, uh, we have completed in one episode and we can repeat this process. Uh, um, yeah, so this will update the controller and we can repeat this process, uh, not for just one episode. We can go and collect certain other examples belonging to other classes and corresponding queries. And we can um, expose the controller to another episode of, um, um, updating the controller. So this third step is called the meta learning, and this step is essentially involves um, teaching the controller to learn from its mistakes when it is presented with different episodes. So uh, we are not um, forcing the controller to learn a specific type of symbol, but rather uh, class of symbols, but rather we are trying the controller for guiding the controller to um, learn to distinguish between any generic type of class. So this is the idea of um, meta learning. So um, now this controller at this stage, when it has been matured by exposing to different types of episodes, and we call it the mature controller. And now this controller is able to do all these different encoding steps that were previously involved in the in a classical HBC scheme, which includes a pre-processing um, and then uh, seed vector generation and then uh, the actual encoding steps. So all of, all of them are now included in, in, inside this controller module. So, um, so as, as, as I said before, so we can go through as many episodes as we want until the controller is uh, pretty much matured. So at this stage, the training stage, the training methodology is, is finished. So we have a mature controller. We can now um, test how good this uh, encoder is, uh, this uh, controller is by doing inference. So during inference stage, the key point here is that we are, we are now feeding with the, the controller with uh, classes that were previously unseen. So these new, new episodes that we are now using to test the controller are never shown to the controller before. So in this case, if you use the same methodology as before, it will first fill up the, the key memories using the support set of the episode. And then it will take uh, one of the queries for at a time, send it to the matured controller um, and generate a query with representation, calculate the similarity scores, and then it will do, a, again, a class-wise aggregation of uh, of the similarity scores based on the, the labels in the value memory. Uh, and then by applying an argmax operation, we can get the predicted class. So this is how basically a, a memory augmented neural network works for future learning problems. Um, so you may have already seen that uh, the, this, this uh, kind of um, approach can quickly lead to a, a problem. So the problem is, um, 
is when we are, are expanding the, the, the size of the problem that we are trying to solve. So earlier we saw uh, a problem with three-way uh, three two-shot problem, but let's say we want to solve a, a larger problem, which includes a, a many number of different classes and, and, and many shots that correspond to each of the classes. So as we increase the problem size, uh, it, it will quickly form a, uh, a bottleneck when we are trying to access the, the memory module because in this case we do not, uh, do not simply have, uh, access a single location in the memory but rather we are uh, doing a comparison between an entire uh, memory space uh, all the vectors that are stored in the memory so so this type, type of accessing memory is called a soft addressing um, now now this, uh, as you increase the problem size, this uh, creates a bottleneck uh, in, the, in accessing the memory, especially in the type of uh, vulnerable type of architectures. Um, and uh, the, the, the experiments have shown that this, this can lead to a, 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 as large as 80% time, complete time that, will, that is going to be stored, uh, that is going to be uh, occupied for this comparison operation where we fetch the data from the memory and uh, conduct these similarities for computation. So um, now to solve this problem, what we're proposing is a, a, what we call a computational memory. So in a computational memory, we are able to, uh, instead of fetching the data from the memory, we can keep the, uh, the data in the memory uh, uh, and then we can simply uh, uh, feed uh, our query vector to the, this computational memory and it will perform the similarity operation in place and just provide us with the, uh, the similarity scores as the output. So to do this, we are exploring certain type of analog uh, memory memory devices, uh, which, can, uh, which can be stored in a uh, 2D array uh, organized as a 2D array as shown here. And now we will, as similar to we saw in our previous slide, we will store our uh, key vectors, key memory vectors along the columns of this uh, array. And then when we get a query vector, we can feed the, the vector as a voltage parser. So we do a conversion of the, the this digital representation of the query vector to a um, um, analog representation by converting uh, to a voltage using digital analog converters. And uh, this will then um, create certain current that flows through these uh, vertical weak lines uh, corresponding to the, the, the element wise modification of the, the value that the element of the, um, representing the key memory for a given key memory vector versus the, uh, the element that representing the uh, yeah, query vector. So this is done by uh, programming the, the the memory device conductance values that that is corresponding to the 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 bit value of the of the key memory vector. So uh, in the end, we can sum the current all along this bit line, and then the result that is coming to the, the bit line is is now somewhat representative of the similarity metric. Uh, so this resulting current, we can then um, convert back to the digital domain using an analog digital converter, and this is this is now uh, pretty much equivalent to the attention vector that we had uh, in our um, uh, normal architecture without the computation memory. The computational memory it still has certain drawbacks, so I'll show it in this next slide. So computational memory uh, do not have a high um, programming uh, precision. So it can only support a few programming levels. So because of that, the, 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 the precision is low. And, and this, this shows a certain uh, uh, read, read out of the, the, key, the, 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 the memory array, so this computational memory array. In this case, we are using a certain type of memory device called phase change memory. Um, in this phase change memory, um, you know, we, in, in, this, in this diagram, you see the, the devices, all of them are programmed to a, 
uh, high conductance state at, uh, at the beginning, and now we are reading the devices after a certain time interval. And as you can see, the conductance values are now um, changed to different values. So there is a spatial variability uh, between different devices, which is, is shown here. So there is essentially this device variability, uh, not only spatial variability, but there's also temporal variability. Let's say we read the same array in another time instance, and we are we see uh, different conductance values in that instance. So to to uh, get, overcome these problems that um, a memory computational memory uh, module will present, we are looking at a certain uh, uh, solutions. So for example, for low precision to overcome this, we, are, we would now want to represent our uh, key memory vectors using binary or bipolar vectors. And um, to overcome the device variability, one we want to um, uh, have a certain robust representations for these key memory vectors. So, uh, so the, you may already know now where we are going. So we want to introduce high dimensional computing to uh, get over these problems. So high dimensional computing, if, if we uh, uh, make sure that our key memory vectors are generated according to the properties of high dimensional computing, we will be able to overcome these challenges we face with the, a typical uh, computational memory uh, device. So now I can um, uh, try to show you how we want to, um, uh, we, we will try to exploit the best, best of both worlds. So uh, we have on one side the memory augmented neural networks, and on the other side we have high dimension computing and uh, memory augmented neural networks um, solves the problems uh, in HPC with respect to the encoding. Um, and on the other hand, high dimension computing facilitates the realization of an explicit memory module, which is now uh, energy efficient because of uh, uh, performing the, the, the operations within the memory. And uh, on top of that, HPC also enables us to perform higher, higher level operations. Uh, when we have a vector representations in high dimensional space, we can perform uh, the usual high dimensional operations such as binding, bundling, uh, permutations, and etc. So, together, memory augmented neural networks and high dimensional computing uh, can be used to build a powerful system to solve artificial intelligence problems. So, um, so now in this slide, I'm trying to show you the, the approach that we are following. So we want to generate, a, we want to guide uh, this controller, which is a neural network controller, uh, to generate representations uh, that are um, amenable for HPC manipulations. And, and for this, this is the approach that we are taking. We have, a, we, we are assigning quasi orthogonal high dimensional uh, dense binary vector, uh, red vectors uh, to unrelated items. So to do this, we, uh, we are uh, exploring several techniques. The one is uh, employing a sharpening function, which is essentially helping us to, um, uh, to generate these quasi orthogonal uh, vectors. And the next is expanding this interface to allow it to generate these high dimensional representations. And then we have a sum loss function and transformations. If we go into details in the next slides, that allows us to generate the dense, which means uh, close to 50% uh, uh, zeros and 50% one, uh, and this this kind of binary vector representations. So this is uh, this is the approach that we're taking. So uh, first, I'd like to quickly go over how we de develop quasi orthogonal representation using a certain kind of sharpening function. So, uh, so now this is, we are going back to this um, uh, the, the, pre the flow that we, that we introduced earlier. So we have our controller here, which is now matching. This is what we're trying to update. And we have the query vectors. Uh, the support vectors are already stored in the key memory and the query vector is now sent to the same controller, generates a query vector. Um, it's the query may be sent to the controller, generates the query vectors, and we uh, perform this cosine similarities course uh, between 
query vector and each of the key memory vectors uh, then uh, it's has, it gives us these attention vectors uh, which will um, which will be used to um, yeah, aggregate based on the class and then uh, compare against the ground truth the error is spread propagated right so um now in this case we are we are inserting a, a sharpening function at this stage here so the, the this states the input as a similarity matrix. So the similarity matrix is here represented using alpha. And, and this is basically the Poisson similarity between query and a given in memory vector. And now here we have our sharpening function. Uh, this will transform the similarity matrix course. And, and this sharpening function will represent using epsilon. And, uh, and basically we will, on top of that, we do a, a normalization to now get our preferred uh, attention vector which with this shown with sigma here. Um, now, uh, in order for us to generate quasi orthogonal representations for uh, uh, unrelated items, we want to define uh, certain conditions that are optimum for a, a sharpening function. Now, these conditions are listed here. Uh, I'll quickly uh, go over them. So, first thing is we want to achieve the, the minimum sharpened value when uh, the two vectors that we are using for the similarity calculation are uh, unrelated to each other or when, when they generate a similarity score which is close to zero. At this point, we want the sharpening function to generate the lowest, uh, lowest value. So this is shown in this figure here. And then we want, as we, as we increase the similarity score, uh, along the positive axis, we want the, um, the, the sharpening function to generate a, a monotonically increasing value. So this is this is shown on this part of the, the graph. And uh, on the negative side, when we increase the similarity scores on the negative axis, uh, we want the sharpening function to generate monotonically decreasing decreasing value. So this is shown on this side of the graph. So Basically, uh, this covers the, the span of all the optimum sharpening function, family of optimum sharpening functions. Um, and we are looking at a, a, a one specific uh, in, in instance. So this is uh, given by this formula here and also shown by this uh, orange curve here. And this uh, we call this a, a soft absolute sharpening function. And this the sharpening function basically meets the optimality criteria. Um, so uh, um, now here we are showing um, uh, results by using this particular soft absolute uh, sharpening function um, uh, on a controller which is now trained with 50,000 training episodes. So what you see here is the correlation uh, between different vectors. Um, uh, yeah, so these vectors are something equivalent to what we'd have received from an item memory in a typical dimensional uh, framework. And now uh, this is concerning a, a, a problem which has 20 classes and in each class we have uh, five different shots. So, um, so yeah, so then um, in each of these points we are um, calculating the correlation between uh, the two vectors that are corresponding to the x coordinate and the y coordinate. Um, so, so basically, the first five vectors are from the same class, so we expect it to have a high a high uh, correlation within this square here, and all the the other squares that are on the diagonal, uh, we want we are expecting it to have a high correlation because these vectors correspond to the same same class, uh, and for the other points in this uh, in this graph. We want the correlation value to be lower because they are corresponding to low, uh, corresponding to unrelated classes. So this is, this is uh, what we can achieve by introducing a soft absolute sharpening function. And, uh, and we also have seen that uh, uh, when we can generate this kind of representations using uh, a sharp, such a sharpening function, we can now uh, even go even further uh, than just doing classification. If you, if you want, we can we can consider other kind of applications. 
like uh, for example bundling these different different shots or that correspond to the same class we, we can bundle these vector representations to have an average prototype representation for that class so this allows us to uh, further compress the uh, the the key memory for example and then for example if you want you can also uh, let's say you get a, a sequence of images if you want uh, you can now do certain binding of different, different vector representations that are coming uh, from the sequence uh, using the similar types of HD operations that you uh, you are familiar with right? so this is also possible here um, now with the same software through sharpening function we are now comparing it against a, a conventional more conventional type of soft max sharpening function now in this graph you see uh, uh, at different uh, episodes uh, what kind of uh, same class similarity that we are achieving uh, which correspond to those diagonal squares and uh, what kind of uh, different class similarity that we will, uh, will be getting so if you compare these two graphs here you will be able to see that uh, soft absolute is able to keep a better margin compared to a soft max kind of sharpening function and on average this this margin is about 1.75 percent better in the case of soft absolute compared to the soft max and this will essentially also lead to uh, getting better accuracy in the end so we observe with three different types of problems uh, for five way one shot 20 way five shot and 100 way five shot problems we are getting always the better accuracy with the soft absolute sharpening function and then its accuracy can get as good as uh, up to 19 percent accuracy better than uh, using a conventional soft max and um, so we looked at uh, uh, one of the techniques so now we go quickly on another kind of technique so this is regarding the transformations that we apply uh, on the, the results that are coming from the controller so that it is able to learn binary vector representations so so far what we have looked at is uh, support vectors or, or query vectors coming from a controller and these are still represented using real valid representations um, and now here we use a cosine similarity and this is um, not so robust when it comes to hardware implementation and the footprint that it takes is larger but now if we uh, by this uh, data we get uh, plus ones and minus ones so this is our bipolar vector representations and in this case uh, since the the norm of the vector is a constant we can simply apply a dot product as our similarity matrix so we can simplify the similarity computation and it can also lead to a more uh, extreme robust uh, robustness to give us uh, extreme uh, extremely robust representations and it will also allow us to have our key memory uh, represented more densely and if we go further step and transform the data to binary so that it has uh, uh, some ones and in the remaining places the zeros in this binary uh, format we can um, again approximate the similarity using the dot product and um, and we get uh, again a robust representation and our key memory is now is the densest with the binary representation um, so these all of these uh, transformations we can now apply to simplify our hardware during the inference time uh, another technique we use is, is uh, some improvements to the loss function to generate these states binary vectors so as i told you earlier so we have our similarity computation which is uh, used as a cosine similarity but we, if you want we can uh, approximate it with the dot product given that our norms uh, work in the denominator uh, are fixed values for bipolar representations this norm is a fixed value by definition uh, because it has ones and minus one so when you compute the L2 norm, so if you square them and sum them, it always gets the same value. But in the case of binary, this, this norm can be varied. But if you make sure that the, the density of the vectors that are picked out from the, uh, the controller is always fixed, we can 
and we can do this approximation again because now the controllers also learn to generate the, the vectors with the singular density. So to do this, we are incorporating a regularized term, which consists of two loss terms. So the first loss term is about having uh, achieving a fixed density. Uh, and the second uh, loss term, we, we, we have it here to avoid reaching a singularity point where the controller always spits out a zero value, uh, which is not ideal. So with these loss terms and this regularized term, we are able to observe that the output, the occupancy ratio of the outputs coming from the from the controller uh, is now getting more compact and narrowed down. The distribution can be narrowed down to uh, the, the, around the value of 0.5 occupancy ratio. And uh, so this, this yellow, um, this yellow distribution is with the regulars and the blue is without the regulation. So we can squeeze the, the distribution by introducing the regularizer. And we also see this reflected in the, the classification accuracy numbers. Without a regularizer, if we just use a binary uh, vector representations, we get a inferior accuracies, but then we can increase them uh, by introducing uh, the dot products in the key with the regularizer. So here you see a, a typical architecture. Uh, this architecture is what we're proposing with uh, the binary key memory, and it's uh, uh, able to do the similar research in a, a constant time. And uh, on the software side, we have our controller, which is consisting of four layers of convolution neural network and one layer of fully connected network. And the output of the last layer is uh, has a certain dimensionality, which is um, the, 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 the dimensionality of the vectors that we are feeding into the key memory. So this is a hyperparameter we can, which we can queue to get high dimensional representation. And in this case, we look at um, a five to a dimensional um, dimensional vector. So it generates basically after this transformation of binarization, bin bin generates five to big values, which is sent to our um, computational memory model. And if you return the, the, the approximated similarity scores, uh, which will be grouped based on the, the class, so this will uh, be indicated by the, the label stored on the value memory. Um, and then when you compare it, uh, the maximum compared value will give us the prediction as the output. Uh, so with this architecture, we are uh, uh, yeah we are getting um, we, we have tried it uh, on uh, this only dot data set um, which has um, uh, example character um, example images from 1600 classes and of them we use about 900 classes um, or 60 percent of the data for training and the remaining 40 percent of the data for testing and, and we can formulate different problem sizes, 5 a one shot, 20 a 5 shot, and 100 a 5 shot are some of the problems that we explore. And what we have seen is that uh, when we have our low precision representation, uh, so we had initially a 32 bit real representation, and if you go to bi bipolar or binary representation, we will only get an accuracy drop of uh, simply 0.56%. On top of that, uh, if we apply these uh, non-idealities coming from the, the PCM crossbar arrays, um, we get a further 1.12% accuracy drop. So here we're comparing an ideal crossbar without any uh, variabilities to a, a real-world PCM uh, crossbar array. So uh, when we do these experiments on this crossbar array, we get the um, Prototype chip. So we get when we do these experiments, we get an accuracy drop of about 1.12 percent. So together, the, the drop of accuracy is uh, within or uh, less than two percent accuracy drop. When we uh, go from a 32 bit real representation to implementing it on a uh, PCM hardware, uh, with PCM hardware platform with a single bit representations. 
uh, as I showed you earlier, we have also seen the certain uh, higher robustness of bipolar representations compared to the binary representation. So here we show you uh, for two problems, five-way one-shot problem and hundred-way five-shot problem. And, and on the x-axis, you see the conductance variation. On a typical uh, real-world uh, PCM, uh, PCM prototype chip, you will see a conductance variation of about 30% variation. But in this experiment, we are, uh, we are looking at uh, varying the conductance value to extreme values to about this uh, to uh, to about hundred percent uh, conductance variation. In this case, uh, the binary representation start to fade its accuracy. Uh, its accuracy degrades in both cases. But interestingly, the bipolar representation retains accuracy within a one percent deviation from the original uh, accuracy that we get without any variability. Um, yeah, so the bottom line is the bipolar representations can be more robust uh, when it is exposed to uh, extreme variations. Um, so we also compared our work with the uh, state-of-the-art future learning uh, implementations uh, in the literature. So, so uh, one key highlight is that uh, if we are looking at uh, low precision uh, memory hardware simulations, Without introducing any noise, uh, we able to we are able to get the best accuracy compared with the other works that are out there. Um, and on top of that, when we also add the and the, the noise coming from the uh, memory devices, uh, uh, which is more like the uh, realistic kind of simulations. In these cases, we get also the best accuracy for future learning problems. Um, and on top of that, we also, um, for the first time, introduce a, a problem which is larger than uh, 20 way, 20 way five shots problem. So this is the, the largest problem size that has been attempted so far. In this work, we also um, try to work on a, even a larger problem, which is a 100 way five shot problem. And this is now the largest problem to date, uh, which is for which the accuracy of this results have been uh, have been shown. All right, so uh, we can now go to the summary of this work. So uh, now we have shown how um, we can generate robust representations uh, using hyperdimension computing to help it uh, uh, for the first. For the memory neural network architectures, memory augmented neural network architectures. And uh, now here uh, we present this methodology for training a controller to generate representations that conform with high dimension computing. Um, and in our experiments, we have seen that computation of the memory with binary PCM devices uh, gets an accuracy of uh, classification accuracy within the 2.7% compared with the 32 bit real. Um, and, and this also allows um, in the future, as a future research direction, it allows to uh, even um, perform higher level object manipulation, such as uh, like the typical HD, HDC uh, 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 vector manipulation, such as binding, bundling, and presentations to explore further um, problems uh, other than classification problems such as reasoning, um, um, etc. So yeah, I'd like to now wrap up my work. So thank you everyone for your attention. Um, yeah, so this work was uh, published recently in the Nature, Nature Communication um, Journal. So here, here you see the link to it and the QR code here. And we also, also um, explained in a blog post here you see the QR code for that. So yeah, thank you to everyone. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thank you, Gitan. Thank you for the excellent talk. So now I open the floor for questions. Please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up. Ethan, it's Graham. Can I, <clears throat> I just ask a question about your sharpening function? So. Um, 
you talk about needing 50,000 epochs to, uh, to actually train the controller. Mm -hmm. if, I, if I understand what you're doing correctly, you, you're, you're essentially selecting some hypervectors that are orthogonal and you're now forcing the controller to learn the features that maximize that separability. Is that, have I understood that correctly? Uh, and why does it take 50,000 epochs? Okay, so, so basically 50,000 is the cap value that we have. Uh -huh. So uh, so basically the idea is that the, the train is that if you go back to the, the this, let's say this figure here. Right, so during training, as I said, we have about uh, 90, uh, 900 uh, um, classes. So of these 900 classes, we separate uh, part of it as the validation set and part of it as the training set. Um, now, during training methodology, what I didn't tell you is that uh, we will um, use the validation set to, um, again, evaluate how good the controller is. So we will, uh, uh, while we are doing the training, uh, while we are presenting uh, like a, uh, episode by episode uh, for, for training the controller. In between, we are also uh, sending a validation episode. What this validation episode is doing is it will see uh, whether the computer, the, the controller has um, um, learned to the optimum level. If you learn it further, it starts to now uh, become uh, an overfit. So we don't want it to be overfit. So um, at some point, starting from 25,000 episode, that is when we see that the controller achieves the best uh, accuracy, on, accuracy on the validation set. And after that, uh, the validation accuracy start to decrease. But we have a cap value at 50,000 episodes. Uh, so this is the maximum episodes that we, that we train the controller with. But basically, the controller that we are taking as the best uh, version is, is far below, far, uh, below the, the 50,000 episode stage. So somewhere starting from 25,000 episode, we will start to see the controller has reached its optimum uh, training uh, in terms of not overfitting. Uh, so we are taking that model uh, to evaluate during inference, not the one that is at the 50,000 episode. Did I answer it? Uh, yeah, sort of. I What's confusing me is, um, so suppose in your support set, you actually chose images that had similarity. You're still forcing things that are similar to be orthogonal in the, in the key memory. Is um, that well, not really. If they are from the same class, if they are similar, we uh, make sure that uh, we have a, a value memory uh, label has the same values so that means um, we want for example if you go to that uh, um, similarity or the, the sharpening function slide i could explain it a bit more so clearly so here for example let's say we are getting a positive similarity and a similarity that is which is close to one and then the, this family of sharpening function will allow us to generate a highly sharpened value uh, when you have a, a even slightly better, uh, it, when it gets a better uh, positive correlated data. Similarly, we can have an alternative where we also generate a high sharpened value for negatively correlated data. Um, so, negative correlation is uh, in, the, in the HPC terms, uh, negative correlation is in, in, in some way it's again correlated to uh, these vectors. What we want to achieve for unrelated vectors is uh, having a uh, no correlation or zero correlation, right? So this is when the vectors become quasi orthogonal. So this is why we want to have the lowest sharpened value when the, the similarity is zero. So basically, uh, for the unrelated vectors, we want the similarity to be zero, the, the sharpened value to be zero. Yeah, okay, I've got it, thanks. Uh, more questions to Gitan? Gitan, I, I wonder if somehow sparsity might, might benefit your architecture or was a having sparse actors 
has no benefits at all in, in, in the hardware you are using. Yeah, so uh, this is something we explored. So, uh, for example, when it comes to the hardware, it's definitely worthwhile doing it with the sparsity uh, because, as you know, like uh, the amount of current that it will, it will generate with um, sparse vectors uh, will be lower. So, that leads to more energy efficient solutions. Um, the problem is with the uh, with the training methodology. So right now we have this um, um, methodology where we, we we use these regularizers to um, achieve a dense vectors. So these regular actions uh, force the guide the controller to learn um, dense vectors, which means uh, uh, fifty percent uh, zeros and fifty percent ones. And, um, so we have also explored the possibility of, uh, yeah, at this point, we use uh, some alteration to the loss terms uh, such that we can force the, the controller to get a lower uh, density. So that means getting more sparse and sparse vectors. But uh, in, this, in this current uh, uh, training methodology, simply changing this part here did not help us. It basically gave a lower accuracy. But, Still, it allowed it, it helped the controller to learn vector representations that are sparse, but in the end, the meta learning was not achieved. So that was some some observation that we had. Thanks. I see. So we have room for maybe one more question. Yeah, if I if I may. Uh, I give them. Thank you. Um, I um, okay. As a similarity measure, you use the cosine similarity or some kind of pro dot product, or yeah. let it be an uh, x or function for the binary, whatever. Mm -hmm. So this similarity is uh, uh, locally defined. It only tells you okay the distance between these two things is maybe one fourth. But it doesn't tell you anything about uh, whether uh, one fourth is a is, is is far away or whether one fourth means where they are very close. And this, of course, depends on the on the information I think you have um, on the uh, on the uh, on your on your state space everywhere. So, so there's no global information in your in your in your uh, 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 cosine similarity, for example. And as far as I understood, in order to uh, to solve this problem of, of, of to discriminate between two things, yeah, uh, you have to invent this uh, sharpening function as you as you as you said. This for me is you somehow have to bring into uh, uh, some uh, global information about this uh, the, the space of all possible uh, vectors you have there, which 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 I call the state space, um, and. Um, and uh, this may also relate a little bit to what uh, Dennis said about sparseness. Um, so this similarity measure only accounts for something uh, very local, but it doesn't account for anything global. But of course, if you have quite sparse vectors, you have global information. And this global information is, uh, as far as I see it, is, uh, is not uh, in, uh, inherited in your, in your uh, similarity definition. Uh, maybe uh, this similarity uh, definition I know uh, simply using the cosine is not uh, the may, maybe there are other uh, opportunities to do that to 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 also include something uh, uh, about the global information of the uh, of the of the of the state space in order to discriminate something because, which is of course at the very heart of, of, of each classification system. Uh, question. Yeah, yeah, I think I, I overall agree with what you said. So basically, um, so the, the methodology that we're using, so that means it has this cosine similarity. It, it uh, simply do this com pairwise comparison of vectors. So basically, it doesn't have any global definition of how the vectors should look like. It's just a um, pairwise comparisons. And since we are using cosine similarity, mm -hmm. it prefers. Um, um, on top of 
with the, the soft absolute sharpening function, it prefers the learning these tense vectors. Uh, and that would, again, be an alternative methodology, uh, which can work with a different uh, similarity metric and uh, with a different sharpening function, which, which can lead to a, a finding more uh, sparse, sparse solutions. Uh, I mean, it, it could be something of course, then your spy, uh, your, your your solutions depend very much on the uh, on the uh, on your sharpening function, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's why we, we try to show here a, a family of sharpening function that could work well. Um, so we used one of these instances, right? So I mean, we also tried with, uh, um, yep. for example, a soft um, ReLU. In this case. Um, we cut down all the negative some, uh, the negative uh, similarities. So yeah, this is another thing. But for the dense representations, what we found is that the soft as the sharpening function to give us the best results. Sorry, um, uh, the 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 the, ease, uh, the the simplest global information about your your, your as I call it uh, the state space, the simply dimension of the vectors. And of course, the, the, the higher the management of the vectors is, the better mm -hmm. you can discriminate. Yeah, that's right. Uh, but I do not see the dimension uh, uh, mentioned anywhere in uh, what you showed us. So oh, yes. I have one uh, backup slide. Sorry, then <laughs> I simply overlooked it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so here, for example, uh, even so with the dimensionality, yes, of course. how different uh, representations uh, achieve different, uh, how well it achieves the calculation accuracy. So the real uh, vectors uh, can perform be better with the low dimensionality, but as soon as we go with the um, low, low precisions, uh, we do not need to go to a higher dimensionality, typically in the range of five, 500 or more. Yeah. And that's when we see the, the same error of accuracy as real representations. And now maybe Dennis' remark uh, might step in. Where then is the sparseness, which then, uh, which then is certainly uh, second very global information. So um, I think this, um, uh, Dennis, I agree completely. You have, uh, your question uh, concerning sparseness is certainly a very interesting, uh, very interesting thing. And maybe all of these things can be. Can be built into this uh, similarity uh, measure, which is then, of course, a little bit different from the from the cosine or the or the dot product or something like that. Okay. No, thanks. So, uh, lots of thoughts uh, yeah. you evoked. Thank you very much. <laughs> Are there any more questions? Um, maybe one. Um, um, could, could it be possible to run this architecture uh, as ensemble with um, various uh, parameters or with va various architecture and maybe running um, a few very sparse architecture alongside? Um, sorry, yeah. so uh, what you're proposing is to uh, Instead of using a convolution a neural network as a controller to uh, explore other architectures, or did I get the question correct? Sorry, um, so you are presenting results for um, various approaches with various functions, mm -hmm. and you 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 have various scores, and I was wondering. So whether you could also run um, ensemble uh, learning approaches by if, summing up the, the, the results of the various approaches. And another thing I was wondering about, if you would um, decrease the size of each of your um, architecture, if you could also, um, so by taking, for, inst for instance, something more sparse or a smaller model, whether you could also um, um, approximate the, the results you have with only one architecture. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I mean, sparsity, as we discussed earlier, this is something that can be explored in this context. So by changing uh, the, the equation between the similarity metric and the sharpening function, this is, again, like one, one further improvement we can do to bring in the sparsity. Um, 
And yeah, other than that, the, the ensembles that you mentioned, um, yeah, it is again one possibility because uh, the, the, the few short problems, uh, for example, it, even with the same controller, it generates uh, different representations for a given um, a given class, right? So, um, and then we have also looked at uh, compressing the key memory by averaging the uh, the different shots from the same class, uh, and then yeah, this approach again gave us uh, almost the same accuracies. So yeah, I mean, this is this is possible. So if you want to compress the key memory um, by uh, let's say writing alternative representations and then uh, averaging the results, this is always possible. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, one more question in the chat. So if you can open the chat, so I will not. Uh... Ah, okay. Let me. Shuffle function close to all the classes to be orthogonal. Does this mean it is possible uh, to infer similarity between classes? Those are most similar to that and then to fish. Yeah, so in this case, um, let's say we, we have visually similar um, examples, but they are from different classes. Uh, still, this uh, the sharpening function and then the, when the whole um, training methodology is considered together, this will generate um, orthogonal vectors for, uh, for examples that are coming from different classes. So it, we may be focusing on uh, fine details that are discriminating those classes. And so basically the, the, the similarities uh, are not representative of the simply the visual similarities, but also it takes into account the, um, which class it belongs to. So if they are from the same class, then you try to try and find the common features from the same class and try to find the um, high dimension representations that are um, that have similarities um, for the same class, but in the same time for visually similar but from different classes, you can try to generate more quasi orthogonal vectors. But of course, there will be some um, in between region, but uh, uh, as we learn and learn better, this is the objective that we try to meet. I hope I answered the question. Yeah, I was just um, observing, I think, that um, it sounds like it would work well as a pure classifier, but not along the lines of a, a sort of a word-to-vec type of um, model where, you, where you're where looking yeah. for similarities between yeah, separate yeah, classes. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not more like, not like okay. a, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Welcome. Um, well, I now look at uh, uh, clocks, so it's eight minutes past nine GMT, and it's um, eight min uh, minutes past 11 p.m. here in Sweden. Uh, so I suggest that we move all poss uh, other possible questions uh, to our um, mailing list, and uh, I put the address uh, to the chat. So um, I would like to thank you, Gitan, for the excellent presentation. And thank you, uh, all of you behind the screens uh, uh, for attending this first webinar. So uh, see you in two weeks. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. See you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye.